Arthur Mann, Mutual's American Warfront correspondent, is in London tonight. He will report from that city first-hand observations of activities on the Western Front. At this time, reports from Europe are subject to censorship at the point of origin. We take you now to London. Good evening. It is a little sad tonight to be broadcasting to you at home who have been celebrating American Independence Day. It is a little sad because for the first time for many years, we Americans in London have not held any communal celebration of what we were used to make a joyful occasion. It was decided that the situation here is too stern and too critical for any light-hearted festivities. It may, in fact, be the last 4th of July, which will be within the ken of some of the few Americans who are still left in Britain. On the other hand, perhaps it was a mistake not to have celebrated Independence Day. For Great Britain is now engaged in the final stage of her own struggle for independence. She has even unconsciously adopted some of the technique of the American revolutionists. We had our Minutemen, those volunteer soldier regulars, on to defend their homes and their neighborhood from enemy attack. Today we have here their equivalent in this besieged Britain, the local defense volunteers, an organization which has been formed throughout the country on the same lines and for the same purpose. They are part of this island's home defense system. Daily the ever-present fact that this land is a besieged country becomes more and more impressed upon the dwellers within its shores. Residential travel and holiday restrictions and the constant German air raids are a continual reminder. The character of these raids, incidentally, remains a puzzle to a good many of us. In the main, they seem still to be confined to attempt on military objectives, harbors, docks, airdromes, and industrial plants. I say attempts because the British defense searchlights, anti-aircraft guns, and fighter planes frequently cause the German raiders to dump their bombs anywhere in order to lighten their planes and get away. But in numbers of planes involved, there is some ground for the belief that these raids so far have been of an exploratory and reconnaissance character. It looks as though the German high command may have been merely peeling out the defense system of Great Britain, trying to lo locate future objectives and possibly training future leaders of much larger scale raids before embarking on a mass air attack or air invasion of this country. There are two schools of opinion here concerning Germany's forthcoming strategy regarding the expected attack on the British Isles. One group believes that there will be tremendous air raids with high explosive and incendiary bombs on this country, coupled with attempts to land by parachute and from two carrying planes, and also on the coast from seaborne vessels. The other group thinks that the Nazi military leaders will pursue a less direct and more roundabout method of attacking the center of the British Commonwealth of Nations and the seat of British sea power. They believe that the Germans will first attack Britain's position in the Mediterranean in conjunction with the Italian forces. The Germans and the Italians, they argue, will try to take Gibraltar, Malta, and the other British naval ports and stations in the Mediterranean basin in an attempt to further isolate Great Britain from her dominion and colonial sources of supply. Whether or not French Mediterranean colonial territory would come within the scope of such action is not so certain, but it might well do so on the basis that Hitler may feel obligated to help Italy satisfy her Mediterranean territorial ambition and thus keep that axis part in a sweep. If and when such a Mediterranean campaign was successful, according to this school of thought, Germany would then turn her air and military might directly on Great Britain. But this period of speculation and uncertainty is not likely to last long. The German technique of the Blitzkrieg is not apt to permit of much delay. There is certainly no official expectation here that this country will have to wait long for Germany's next move, and the government's defense preparations have been made on that basis. At least one thing has been learned and digested from the German Blitzkrieg in Belgium and France. Regulations restricting residents, holiday movements, and weekend travel have been designed partly with the object of doing all that is possible in advance to keep civilians and non-essential persons off the road at a time of crisis. No refugee columns are wanted here. Britain's increasing defense preparations are taking place also in a less spectacular sphere than the military one. Finances are playing an equally important part in this struggle for survival. In order to encourage the public's investment of savings in war loans and to conserve raw material, labor, and manufacturing resources, 
The government has already cut down the amount of consumer goods on the retail market by about 50% for, for a wide range of articles of all kinds. Now it is proposing to place a sales tax on goods which would further limit the public's buying capacity. Some mercantile circles expect this tax to amount to as much as 25%. On the other hand, the government is being equally active in encouraging Britain's export trade, particularly to the United States and to South America, in order to obtain foreign exchange with which to help finance our huge purchases of war supplies and raw materials abroad. More and more is the war effort taking war effort here taking on the pattern of a totalitarian. In this connection, I heard today of a piece of forthcoming government action which shows British Labour's determination to make sacrifices for the cause of victory. With the full approval and concurrence of the, of the Labour ministers and the Labour Party and trade union leaders, the government, according to my informant, will shortly pass into law an act setting up a National Industrial Arbitration Council whose decision will be binding. This council will adjudicate on all industrial disputes which cannot otherwise be settled. This means, in effect, compulsory arbitration, a principle which British labor and British trade unions have hitherto absolutely refused to accept. Its forthcoming acceptance, for the duration of the war only, it should be added, means that British Labour has now decided that the war effort must not be slowed down by strikes. Meanwhile, Great Britain appears to have good reason to be satisfied with the results so far of her air offensive against Germany and German-occupied territory. Air Marshal Sir Philip Dubert, uh, a member of the British Air Staff, in a broadcast talk here tonight, revealed some pictures of these attacks which were not generally appreciated here, though they naturally were by the Germans. In the last 49 days, British raiders, the uh, British bombers raided Germany on 36 nights. During that time, there were only 13 German air raids on Great Britain. The British night bombers had, in addition, taken on more than their specifically allotted job when over the Third Reich. They have a habit of looking around for an extra bit of work to do. One of their stunts is to attack German planes which may be practicing night landings on their home air drones. One British squadron during recent nights said Sir Philip destroyed four German planes so engaged. Intelligence reports he indicated show that the British bombing raids have had a very considerable effect on Germany's industrial and transport system. The supplying of the German forces in Belgium and northern France is reported to have been greatly interrupted by the British bombing of railway lines. Without wanting to, wanting to exaggerate the damage so far done, Sir Philip emphasized that all signs show that this pressure, if maintained, may in the long run contribute effectively to the winning of the war. The problem, therefore, he concluded, is to maintain Great Britain as a secure base from which to develop her offensive, at first mainly by sea and air, and later perhaps on land, against the German military organization. The big news here tonight, of course, as you have already heard, was the announcement by Prime Minister Winston Churchill and A.B. Alexander, First Lord of the Admiralty, that a large part of the French fleet is safely in British hands. But there will probably be no more terrible drama in this whole war, however long it lasts, than that tragic but necessary sinking of the Pink Squadron at Oran. That act was the epitaph of the Anglo-French alliance. Now Britain truly fights alone. Thank you and good night. We return you to the Mutual Broadcasting System in New York. Arthur Mann, Mutual's American Warfront correspondent, has reported direct from London first-hand observations of activities on the Western Front. Now, by transcription, the orchestra plays the scherzo from the third movement of Midsummer Night's Dream. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
smoke is billowing up from the Khan area. The results of this visual bombing attack are really terrific. Hundreds upon hundreds of pounds of bombs are raining down on this stricken town. And still the bombers come pouring in. There seems to be no end to them. This is an attack in a big way. The enemy is throwing up everything he has in the book, but he seems not able to get in any hits on our plane. Lots of near misses, but no telling shots. One bomber passing overhead has lost part of his tail assembly, although the pilot's his pilot is lower than the other planes, and his flight, he's keeping her straight and steady on a homeward course. The whole target area is a seething mass of smoke, and in the growing darkness, I can see the first dull red outline of the fire that is apparently raging in camp. It'll be a big bonfire soon, and you can look for those words, big fires were left burning in tomorrow's communique. Pilotless planes could never do a job like this, I'll bet. And now smoke is spreading over Khan, great clouds of it mushrooming upwards, and the flames are beginning to show an angry red color. Well, now the Germans are dive bombing a convoy out into the sea. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven German dive bombers, Junkers 87. There's one going down on his target now. Bomb. No, he missed the ships. He hasn't hit a single ship. There are about ten ships in the convoy but he hasn't hit a single one. And uh, there you can hear our anti-aircraft going at them now. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, there are about ten German machines dive-bombing a British convoy, which is just out to sea in the channel. I can't see anything. No, we thought he got a German one had been got then, but now the British fighters are coming up. 
And here they come. They come in absolute steep dive, and you can see their bombs actually leave the machines and come into the water. You can hear our own guns going like anything now. I'm looking round now. I can hear machine gun fire, but I can't see our spit fires. There's, there must be somewhere there. Oh, here's one coming down now. There's one coming down in flames. There's somebody's hit a German, and he's coming down. There's a long streak. He's coming down completely out of control, a long streak of smoke. He's, uh, our man's bailed out by parachute. The pilot's bailed out by parachute. He's a Junkers 87, and he's going slap into the sea, and there he goes. Smash! Terrific crumble of water, and there was a Junkers 87. There was only one man got out by parachute, so presumably there was only a crew of one in it. Here comes this one spit far. There's a little burst. There's another bomb dropping. Yes, it dropped. Oh, they missed the convoy. You know, they haven't hit the convoy in all this. The sky is absolutely patterned now with bursts of anti-aircraft fire, and the sea is covered with smoke where the bombs have burst. But as far as I can see, there's not one single ship hit. And there is definitely one German machine down. And I'm looking across the sea now, I can see the little white dot of parachute as the German pilot uh, is floating down towards the spot where his machine crashed with such a big fountain of, of uh, water about uh, two minutes ago. Now then, oh, there's a terrific mix-up now over the channel. Uh, it's impossible to tell which are our machines and which are the Germans. There's one definitely down in this battle, and there's a fight going on. There's a fight going on. You can hear the little rattles of machine gun bullets. That was a bomb, as you may imagine. Well, now, everything is peaceful again for the moment. The Germans, who came over in about 20, 20 dive bombers, delivered their attack on the convoy, and I think they've made off as quickly as they came. The, oh, yes, I can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten Germans herring back towards France now for all they can go, and here are our Spitfires coming after them. There's going to be a big fight, I think, out there, but it will be too far away for us to see. Of course, there are lots more German machines up there. Can you see? Can you see, Phil? Yes, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven on top layer. One, two, three, there's two layers of German machines. They were all, I think, I, uh, I couldn't swear to it, but they were all, I think, Junkers 87. Where are two more parachuters? Okay. Flying sideways. No, I think they're seagulls. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. You can hear the anti-aircraft batteries still going. Well, that was a really hot little engagement while it lasted. No damage done except for the Germans, who lost one machine, and the German pilot is still on the end of his parachute, though appreciably nearer the sea than he was. I can see no boat going out to pick him up. So he'll probably have a long swim ashore. But that was a very unsuccessful attack on, on the convoy, I must say. Now there are one, two, three, oh, whoops, there's a dog fight going up there. There are four, five, six machines wheeling and turning around. Now, hock at the machine guns going. Hock. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now there's something coming right down on the tail of another. Yeah, they they're, going back they're so being chased home, and, and how they're being chased home. There are three Spitfires chasing three Messerschmitts now. Oh, oh no. boy, look at them going, and look how the Messerschmitts... Oh, that is really grand. And there's a Spitfire just behind the first two. He'll get them. Oh, yes. Oh, boy, I've never seen anything so good as this. Uh, the RAF fighters have really got these boys, Tate. Uh, there's... Our, our machine is catching up the Messerschmitt now. It's catching it up. It's got the legs of it, you know. Now, right in the sight. Now, go on, George. You've got him. Boop, boop. No, no. The distance is a bit deceptive from here. You can't tell. But I think something definitely is going to happen to that first Messerschmitt. Tuesday, July 23rd. Today in Europe, Great Britain will get the largest budget in its history. And the British people will be about to give some 60% of their national income in the defense of their land and their attempt to overthrow totalitarianism. In the Western Hemisphere at Havana, the conference of 21 American republics gets into full swing under the leadership of the United States. But now the news direct from important capitals, Berlin, London, and Havana. First, Edwin Hartridge reporting from Berlin. This is Berlin. It will be war between England and Germany. That was the official statement handed out at the Foreign Office press conference this noon. It was the German government's answer to the speech of Lord Halifax last night. The English Foreign Affairs Minister had stated that Great Britain would carry on the war. And so the Wilhelmstrasse this morning, or less than an hour ago, had its answer. The Foreign Office spokesman said that Lord Halifax had refused to accept the peace officer of Herr Hitler. All is over between the two countries. There will be war, he said. 
And this we have from official quarters, the first concrete statement about the future. It is a grim statement. It seems to mean that all attempts to end this war between the two great remaining powers in Europe today are finished. Here Hitler has thus indicated that he is ready for the Blitzkrieg. When we'll start is another unknown chapter to this story. And here are some of the headlines in the Berlin papers this morning, which tell their own story. The folks should be a doctor. Churchill's answer, the cowardly murdering of a defenseless population. The local Anzeiger, Churchill's answer, murderous attacks on civilian population. And this welfare block, Churchill's answer, bombs on German towns. And these same headlines appear at the top of the front pages of the Borsten Zeitung and the Deutsche Allgemeine Zeitung. And the sub-headlines -head amplify on what is, quote, Churchill's answer, unquote. For instance, they report air attacks on women and children, criminal raids by night on non-military objectives, civilian populations attacked at random. And so, the Berlin Press this morning is launching a concerted campaign against the British government. And what is interesting is the story under these headlines, which, word for word, is the same in all the papers. The German story starts out as follows, quote, a careful check on the enemy's air raids has shown that the British Air Force has multiplied its attacks on non-military objectives since Friday, when the Fuhrer, in his great speech, tried once more to show the British people the way of common sense. Great numbers of bombs have been dropped, but the damage suffered was relatively insignificant. It has become clear that the enemy wants to strike at the civilian population, unquote. Then the story continues to give some details of these British air raids. And some of these interesting details have not yet and released in the press and the communiques. Here's a gist of the story. The British Air Force launched strong attacks against the large seaport of Bremen in recent nights, during which three persons were killed, three seriously injured. Several resorts on the German islands in the North Sea were also objectives of the Royal Air Force. And the German report goes on to state that Hamburg was again attacked on the night of July 20th, 21st. And numerous people were injured during the raids in the heavily populated quarters of that city. Our military objectives in the towns of Paderborn, Hagen, and Bochum in Westphalia were also raided. And during a night attack on the town of Schwerin, British planes first dropped flares before unloading their cargoes of bombs. And this raid, ten people were killed, according to the German story. Kassel was also attacked on the night of July 20th, 21st. And during these raids, the British also used flares. Moreover, according to the German report, the neighborhood of Castle was also bombed. The German story, which appears in all the papers this morning, concludes with, quote, as the enemy used parachute flares, his intention to hit the civilian population has become evident, unquote. This story will certainly not build up any love for the Royal Air Force among the German newspaper readers. And it strikes a positive note, the first in days that have followed Herr Hitler's speech. But well, the German press has been greatly angered at the immediate and very critical British reaction to Herr Hitler's speech to the Reichstag. The papers accused the British government and the press of not speaking for the people, but only for what they described as the British warmongers. And now that that negative campaign seems to have changed, the, British, the German press is stepping into high gear. For its readers, the German press today gives what it considers to be Winston Churchill's answer to Herr Hitler's address. And that answer according to the Berlin Morning Papers, is the bombing of civilian populations and non-military objectives. This is Edwin Hartrich. I return you now to Columbia in New York. This is New York, and here's the latest news from Havana. The 21 American republics under the leadership of the United States are moving toward a new plan to isolate the new world from war and from economic encroachment by dictators. This morning, a private session of the Conference of Foreign Ministers will receive drafts of proposals regarding new world possession of European powers. Plans also will be outlined for economic collaboration in the Western Hemisphere and for combating fifth column activities in the Americas. Now we return to Europe for more news. News reported from the British capital by Eric Severide. Go ahead, London. This is London. The British Admiralty last night announced a new move to discourage a German invasion of Ireland. A minefield has been laid closing off the Irish Sea on the south. At its widest point, this field of explosive covers 50 miles of water. It extends from the Devon Cornish coast to the territorial waters of Era. And all ships wishing to enter the Irish Sea must now pass around the north of Ireland. The minefield helps to nullify the advantage of German submarine bases on the French coast. 
This afternoon, in the House of Commons, Sir Kingsley Wood, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, will make what is expected to be the shortest budget speech on record. It's a supplementary budget, calling for an additional two and a half billion dollars to meet the increased cost of war. There will be new income and luxury taxes. The individual's purchasing power is to be cut down to prevent the present trend toward higher prices from getting out of hand. The Chancellor may adopt the famous Keynes plan, rejected by Sir John Simon. This idea is to continue direct taxation of the wealthy and at the same time have the poorer classes forego part of their wages until after the war. This is to be combined with a system of family allowances and cheap prices for basic necessities. Or the Chancellor may increase the range of direct taxation to take in the bulk of wage earners as well as the wealthy. But no matter what is announced to Parliament today, one result is inevitable. Greater sacrifices for everybody in Britain. Britain's overseas trade in the month of June took another drop. Imports dropped about $60 million compared with May, and exports about $50 million. Here's this morning's communique from the Air Ministry and the Ministry of Home Security. I quote, During the night, enemy aircraft dropped small numbers of bombs at many coastal points, including the Thames Estuary, South Wales, and Southeast Scotland. No fatal casualties are reported, but in one Scottish town, several persons were injured and damage was done to shop and house property. Farm buildings were also damaged in southeast Scotland. In England and Wales, little damage was done, but in one southeast coast town, an unoccupied house was demolished, and an electric cable damaged, which was soon repaired. Unquote. We're told there were no casualties in the estuary of the Thames, although about 20 bombs fell there. No estimation of the damage to shipping or docks is given in accordance with the general rule on these raids. At least a hundred firebombs, as well as high explosives, fell in southeastern Scotland. The Admiralty has announced that a British destroyer, the Brazen, was sunk by a flight of German bombers. She sank while being towed back into port after the attack. The Admiralty says the destroyer's anti-aircraft fire accounted for three of the bombers and that all of the crew were saved. The Brazen was the vessel which located the sunken submarine Thetis last year in Liverpool Bay. According to the Admiralty, British destroyers, destroyer losses are more than made up by the 40 new destroyers. And six of these ships, under construction for Brazil, have now been taken over for Britain. Another communique this morning says that early yesterday morning, planes of the fleet air arm made an attack on Bergen. The visibility was low and weather conditions unfavorable, and so the main objectives were not in all cases attained. We're told that bombs were dropped on the seaplane base, however, and an enemy anti-aircraft ship was sunk. Sixty American businessmen in London have formed their own local defense volunteer unit. The prime mover in this was Charles Sweeney. And personal friends in America, they said, sent over their guns and equipment now, these Americans have now been training after working hours for the last six weeks. A report comes to London from Zurich this morning, which quotes Berlin observers as saying from Berlin that an official announcement will be made there today following the broadcast by Lord Halifax. This announcement from Berlin, we're told, would be the signal for the German attack on England. And according to the same story from Zurich, this would take the form of mass air raids. This is CBS in London, returning you now to New York. That was the voice of Eric Severide reporting from London. Here's the latest news from the Balkans. Bucharest reports this morning say that Romania expects this week to learn Adolf Hitler's views about supporting Hungary's territorial demands against Romania. Hungary wants the return of Transylvania, ceded to Romania after the World War. The Romanians also believe that Russia soon will make new demands on their nation. Now the news from the Italian capital, reported by Cecil Brown. Go ahead, Rome. This is Rome. The fascist press answers today the speech of Lord Halifax. The Rome newspaper, Popolo di Roma, says, quote, Halifax has replied to the generous appeal of Hitler with a negative and Jesuit speech, unquote. A message of headline reads, Halifax invokes the aid of God for the war to the end. Halifax, says the paper, has the sound of a hero who trembles. The British Foreign Minister said that England wants a peace with justice. 
and the fascist press believes he used a phrase copyrighted by Mussolini. The Popolo di Roma says when Halifax speaks of peace with justice, he contaminates and falsifies the Mussolinian formula. The Roman press, however, still counts on the overthrow of the Churchill government. The papers here insist that Churchill and the people are at opposite ends about continuing the war. They maintain that if the British people could make a free choice, they would vote for immediate peace with the Axis. Yesterday, a report from Switzerland was printed here that the Churchill government might fall in 24 hours. According to this report, the House of Commons today would refuse to approve supplementary expenditures. This, the report claimed, would force Churchill to resign. Whether that happens remains to be seen this afternoon. The first concrete result of the talks Foreign Minister Chano held in Berlin on Saturday appeared today. The Nazi Foreign Minister von Ribbentrop has called the Romanian Prime Minister and Foreign Minister to Salzburg for a chat. The meeting is scheduled for Friday. Neutral circles here in Rome believe that King Carol is about to hear the first direct orders from the Axis powers on how his country should behave in the future. The fascist press maintains that all is quiet in the Balkans, but it's felt in other quarters here that there is considerable rumbling. Russian pressure on Romania and the strengthening friendship of the Soviets with Yugoslavia may complicate the Axis plans for the Balkans. Bulgaria appears to be growing extremely restive about her claims against Romania for Dobrugia. Hungary wants Transylvania, but she will behave until Budapest gets the signal from Roman Berlin. But a Russian move to help King Carl realize his ambitions would throw Bulgaria more than she is now into the Russian sphere. Therefore, as we see it here, Romania is to be told on Friday that partition, as apparently it must to small countries, has now come to Romania. Haile Selassie, the sad-eyed lion of Judah, former emperor of Ethiopia, is reported in the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan. The fascist press and radio are poking fun at him, and have picked him to head what they call the British retreat in Africa. The newspaper Messagero describes him today as a lion outside of a circus. The communique of the Italian high command is brief today. Italian planes bomb Marsa Matru and C.D. Barani. These are two British bases in northern Egypt. The bulletin says fascist bombers also raided right here. The British attacked near Odawa in East Africa, but the Italians say no damage was caused. The press here today confirms that the British are not quite ready to abandon Gibraltar. The Gibraltar garrison has been reinforced and now numbers 10,000 men. The papers say the Italian air attack on Gibraltar has created panic there and all civilians now want to get away. A new tax went into effect today. It is 2% on all salaries and all purchases, and the money is to be used by the government to assist the families of men called to the covers. This is Cecil Brown and Lane returning you to Columbia in New York. This is New York, and that concludes this morning's report of important European developments, reported from Berlin by Edwin Hartridge, from London by Eric Seferide, and from Rome by Cecil Brown. Larry Elliott speaking. This is the Columbus, Saturday, July 27th. Today in Europe, new and intensified German air raids have been reported over England, Scotland, and Wales. Continued rumors are heard of new peace gestures by Adolf Hitler, forwarded through neutral countries. Britain says that her answer is no peace with Hitler, and the British today are calling another 300,000 men to the colors. Now the news from Europe direct, Berlin, London, and Rome. First, for the report from the German capital, go ahead, Berlin. This is Berlin. The strange row in this war continues. People keep wondering when the attack on Britain will get underway, but no one knows. Most Germans you talk to are deadly sure that the war will be over before the winter sets in. After what happened to France, they're confident of the next phase. The newspapers make it next possible of the air attacks on Britain, and especially on British shipping in the Channel. Yesterday, for a change, German motor torpedo boats carried out an attack on British shipping to Brighton. A special war communique came out late last evening, claiming that 34,000 tons of shipping had been sunk in this speedboat raid. The first Schwerbacher claims this morning that the Germans have sunk 100,000 tons of enemy shipping in the last two days alone. But of course, 
All of this is merely skirmishing. The real war with Britain, as realized, has not begun. Probably we must wait another ten days at least, perhaps longer. In the meantime, Germany is consolidating its position in the Balkans and giving the governments in Southeastern Europe their first inkling of the kind of new order which Germany expects to set up if and when the war is won. Recently, the Hungarian Prime Minister and Foreign Minister journeyed to Munich to see her degree about the matter. Hungary, of course, wants Transylvania back from Romania. But the German course is that such matters as this can wait until the war's end. Yesterday, it was the turn of the Romanians, who have swung so quickly into the German camp since the collapse of France. The Romanian Prime Minister and Foreign Minister arrived in Salzburg yesterday, had a talk with Herr Hitler and Herr von Ribbentrop over the new order, and left last night for Rome to hear Mussolini's ideas on the same subject. The Romanian minister is quoted in the German press today as stating that the foreign policy of his land has taken a new turn. Bucharest's attitude towards Britain is shown in the statute today, which stated as a reprisal for the seizure by the British of three Romanian ships at Port Said, the Romanians have confiscated 18 British tugs on the Danube. Romania is also turning against its former ally, France. Several French oil experts and directors of Franco-Romanian oil companies, as reported, have just been expelled from Romania. Following the Romanians come the Bulgarians, who arrived today for talks with Herr Hitler and Herr von Ribbentrop. Tomorrow the Slovaks arrive. Dr. Tiso, their president, and Dr. Tuka, the, Tuka, the foreign minister. All roads on the continent now lead to Berlin, or wherever Herr Hitler and his foreign minister happen to be. And Germany naturally is taking advantage of its new position as a dominant power on the continent. Incidentally, I noticed by the photograph that the Romanian statesmen wore uniforms when they arrived in Salzburg yesterday, just as do the Germans and Italians. It seems to be the new mode in Europe for the civilian statesmen. The Slovaks wear uniforms too on state duty. While the war effort lags, the press here gives a lot of attention to the opening of Munich today of the exhibition of German art. An annual affair. Dr. Goebbels opened it this morning with a broadcast speech. Only one enemy remains, said the propaganda minister, and no one doubts who will win in the end. A German nation, he went on, is in its entirety a fighting nation. Here, Hess, Hitler's deputy, opened the exhibition in the name of the Fuhrer, saying, quote, I greet him as the protector of German culture, unquote. The theme of war dominates this exhibition of German art. There are paintings of the grim bombardment of Warsaw by heavy German artillery, and I noticed one painting entitled Bombardment of the Westerplatte, and it shows the German battleship Schleswig Holstein firing point blank into this little island by Danzig, where the Poles defended themselves against overpowering odds so violently. There is a whole room devoted to paintings of the Polish war and three to the war in the West. It's announced in Berlin today that on the orders of Herr Himmler, chief of the secret police, a Polish land worker has been hanged. The charge is stated to be immoral conduct. Returning now to CBS in New York. That was Willie Malshire reporting from Berlin. Here's the latest news from the Balkans. Today at Salzburg, Austria, important talks are to take place between German and Russian officials. Romanian Premier Gigartu and Foreign Minister Manolescu meet in a few hours with Nazi Foreign Minister von and later today, the Romanian pair are to see Adolf Hitler. Now the news from the British capital, reported by Edward R. Murrow. Go ahead, London. This is London. We were told last night how the narrow reaches of the English Channel were crisscrossed. of the smallest units in the German and British navies. A German squadron of torpedo boats attempted to sink a British convoy. Nine Nazi speedboats encountered two British motor boats, aided by two destroyers. The engagement lasted 15 minutes until the German motorboats threw up a smoke screen and fled to the French coast. These deadly little naval craft are designed to dark in, fire their torpedoes, and then speed away before the deck guns can be brought to bear on them. And the British motorboat resembles an ordinary speedboat. They're 70 feet long, mount two torpedoes and heavy machine guns. The crews are protected against heavy seas by padded ceilings and rubber-cushioned floors. They carry a crew of nine. 
The German torpedo boats are longer, about twice as heavy, and somewhat slower. Their top speed is about 44 miles an hour compared to the British 52. They resemble a slender tugboat and carry 17 men. They're probably more seaworthy than the British craft and are able to operate from the fjords of Norway. The British Isles got small attention from the German Air Force last night. A few bombs were dropped at isolated points. One later was knocked down. Towns in southwest England and Wales were bombed this morning, but no details are available. Romania seems to be leading in the matter of seizing ships. According to latest reports, the British authorities at Port Said have seized three Romanian vessels, one freighter and two large tankers. But the Romanians have seized 20 British oil barges on Danube. British correspondents in Bucharest predict that there will be further reprisals against British vessels on the Danube. Britain can do little to influence the outcome of the Balkans poker game now in progress. But it is believed here that the showdown is likely to occur in the immediate future. British correspondents report the most intensive Russian propaganda campaign in the Balkan countries for 20 years. The main question seems to be whether Moscow will limit its action to diplomatic pressure, propaganda, and intimidation. Some British correspondents in the Balkans are hopefully asserting that the Russian trade mission now on its way to Yugoslavia is in reality a military mission, trying to set up an alliance between Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union. While the war against Britain is confined to the air action, mainly against British convoys, interest in the war that seems far away, the war in the Middle East, is increasing. While it's generally agreed that the British Navy has lived up to its reputation in the Mediterranean, there is some concern about the land fighting. There has been no important change in the strategic position as a result of the action between British and Italian troops. But the Italians have the initiative. And it is felt that their local successes may influence the attitude of the native population. Commander King Hall, in his weekly newsletter, deprecates the manner in which the British public was told of the capture of Kassala by the Italians. He says the news, as given out here, suggested that it was a mere outpost of no importance, and that its occupation by the Italians was part of the British plan. Kassala is a large and important town, the headquarters of a province, and the market of an important agricultural district. It's on the railway between Port Sudan and the Blue Nile, and its capture by the Italians may have some important possibilities if the Italians decide to launch a concentric attack on the Nile Valley. The latest German achievement reported in London tells of the capture of another army leader, this time Colonel Mary Booth, chief of the Salvation Army in Belgium. She is reported to be interned at Constance near the Swiss frontier. The House of Commons is scheduled to discuss foreign policy in a secret session on Tuesday. There is a feeling amongst many members that too many secret sessions are being held. The House guards jealously its right to question and criticize ministers and policies and has no desire for the business of secret sessions to become a habit. Sir Kingsley Wood's new budget is still the target for criticism. This morning's Daily Mail, Daily Express asks, where is all the money to come from to pay for the war? It's not coming out of this new budget. Lord Beaverbrook's paper then proposes two methods of increasing the government's revenue. The first is to levy more income tax on the people whose incomes range from $800 to $2,000 a year. And the second is a flat capital levy of 10% on all fortunes. The British Red Cross raised a little money in an unusual way yesterday. A chicken was killed by machine gun bullets fired in a fight between German and British aircraft. The owner auctioned it off for $40 and gave proceeds to the Red Cross. I return you now to CBS in New York. That was Edward R. Murrow reporting from London. This morning in Rome, it was announced that the American ambassador, William Phillips, is leaving Italy for the United States Monday to confer with President Roosevelt. Now the latest news from the Italian capital, reported by Cecil Brown. Go ahead, Rome. Uh, hello, CB. Uh, as I informed you before, Cecil Brown is unable to come to the studio this morning. So we return you to CBS in New York. You've just heard the announcement, ladies and gentlemen, that Mr. Brown is unable to uh, arrive at the studios this morning to bring you the latest news report from Rome. We have here a dispatch which says the Italian planes violently bombed the British naval base at Malta during the night. This comes from a high command communique. Rome also reports that Italian planes bombarded Gibraltar last night for the second straight night. The bombardment was described as violent. And from Spain, it is reported that Italian airplanes which raided Gibraltar yesterday and last night killed four persons 
and injured 50. The planes attacked in the morning, but were driven off before they could drop their bombs. The planes returned in the evening, however, and dumped bombs on the fortress and harbor. Premier Mussolini, who celebrates his 57th birthday Monday, showed foreign correspondents today how he is keeping fit. Receiving 45 foreign correspondents at his riding ring at the Via Colonia, Mussolini went through early morning exercises during which he rode his horse over 19 hurdles, including one five feet two inches high. On the highest hurdle, one of two cavalrymen who followed Mussolini knocked down the top bar, but Mussolini cleared it easily. After completing the jump, Mussolini wearing cavalry boots, riding breeches, and a sleeveless white jersey, which contrasted with his bare brown arms, rode up to the correspondent and, speaking in German, said, Am I sick? Am I tired? Then he smiled and galloped off. Before he took the jump, Mussolini mounted on a German cavalry horse named Taina from Hanover, greeted the correspondents one by one as Press Minister Alessandro Povolini presented us. It was the first time in three and a half years that Mussolini had received newspaper men. Colonel Camillo Rodolfi, who is riding master and fencing instructor, always accompanies Mussolini on such exercises, told me afterwards, Il Ducci does this every morning. Instead of coffee, he takes these early morning jumps. He likes plenty of exercise and very little to eat or drink. Being a vegetarian, he eats only soup and vegetables, mostly greens, and never touches meat. Official German news agency reported from Tallinn, Estonia today that the Minister of Commerce there had returned from a two-week visit to Moscow and announced that in the future, all Estonian industry would obtain raw materials from Russia. Estonia and other Baltic countries recently applied to Russia for permission to become autonomous Soviet republics under the Russian Soviet. At the same time, the Tallinn newspaper, Rosalit, reported that 103 banks and almost 500 factories in various industries would be nationalized immediately. At Havana, the 21 American republics virtually have adopted a Declaration of Havana, regulating the future of orphaned European colonies in the Western Hemisphere. The Declaration is expected to reiterate that the New World remains isolated from the wars of the old and will not tolerate political or economic inroads by Nazis, fascists, or communists. The 21 American republics are expected to declare flatly that New World territory must not be transferred from one Old World power to another. The Declaration, so far as it affects British, French, and Dutch colonies in the Americas, is a compromise between the original United States plan 